On August 12, 2000, the nuclear-powered Russian submarine Kursk sank in the Barent Sea for reasons unknown. It would be years before the fate of the Kursk was fully understood, and even now, there is still some controversy surrounding it. But it's hard not to wonder what happened out there that day. Today, we're going to take a look at what happened to the Russian submarine that exploded and killed 118 sailors. Okay, let's give this submarine story a wide berth. The Kursk submarine was a big, burly piece of Russian engineering. Specifically, the Kursk was what was known as an Oscar II Project 949A Ante, which is to say, a nuclear-powered cruise missile submarine designed and built to go after NATO aircraft carrier groups. From an engineering perspective, the Oscar IIs were built with a double hull separated by 3.5 millimeters and were divided into 10 different compartments. The sail had a reinforced double cover, which was designed to give the sub the ability to break through the Arctic ice cap. And at a length of about 154 meters, it was 10 meters longer than the previous Oscars. Eleven of these subs were made between 1985 and 1999, and several of those are actually still in service today. These big boys were considered pretty much unsinkable. Apparently, the Russians had never heard of the Titanic. So when the Kursk went down on a training exercise, it really caught them off guard. It was at 11.28 a.m. on August 12, 2000, while doing training exercises in the Barents Sea, that an explosion rocked the Kursk. The vessel quickly sank to the seabed, 354 feet below the surface, and came to a rest at the bottom of the freezing cold, watery depths. Just a little more than two minutes after the initial explosion, a second, more massive one took place inside the Kursk. What was supposed to be an exercise wherein the Kursk fired two dummy torpedoes at the Russian battlecruiser, the Pyotr Veliki, had turned into a real-life drama that had the world watching in disbelief to see if any members of the 118-member crew would survive. However, in a twist right out of a Tom Clancy novel, it would be several long, agonizing hours before anyone even knew anything was wrong. The first indication that something was amiss came when the Kursk failed to check in that evening. At that point, the Russians sent out rescue ships, which located the accident area the next morning on August 13th. All of the initial rescue attempts failed, however, due to a combination of factors, including poor weather, the angle of the Kursk, and perhaps most significantly, a lack of appropriate rescue equipment. The United Kingdom, the United States, and Norway all offered to assist with rescue operations. But apparently having seen the hunt for Red October, the Russians refused the assistance. At least they did at first. Four days after the initial disaster, the Russians changed their minds and agreed to accept international help. As all this was going down, the newly elected president, some rando named Vladimir Putin, was vacationing in a resort on the Black Sea. You would think losing a nuclear submarine would send the new president leaping into action, but Putin, not so much. Instead of cutting his vacation short, Putin stayed on holiday for four more days. While Putin claims that it wouldn't have made a difference in the handling of the incident, since he is connected to the military wherever he goes, even he admitted that in retrospect, it would have been better to return to Moscow, at least for public relations sake. He admitted this much in an interview with the late Larry King. The delay in asking for international help may have been a major mistake. When Norwegian divers finally managed to open the Kursk's airlocks on October 21st, they did not find the survivors they were hoping for. Instead, they found that the cabin had been flooded and concluded that all 118 crewmen had been tragically killed. Saddest of all, when they found the body of Lieutenant Captain Dmitry Kolesnikov, they noticed a note in his pocket. It was written several hours after the explosions and stated that there were 23 survivors. Unfortunately, rescue crews did not arrive in time for them. Initially, some high-level Russian officials claimed that the accident was caused by a collision with a NATO submarine that was spying on the maneuvers. According to this claim, the USS Memphis collided with the Kursk and then went to a Norwegian port for emergency repairs. While there is no direct evidence that this occurred, the theory can't be completely dismissed. 
The Russians supported their assertion by pointing to satellite imagery of a U.S. submarine that was docked in a Norwegian port on August 19th, a few days after the accident. And a collision wouldn't have been unprecedented. There have actually been 11 such collisions recorded in the area since 1967. The explosion that ultimately destroyed the Kursk must have been massive. At least, that's what's suggested by seismic readings of the event. Here's how it went down. First, there was a small explosion that registered on seismographs. Then, 135 seconds later, there was a second explosion that was an astounding 250 times larger than the first. The second explosion was so big, it registered all the way on the other side of the Arctic Circle in Alaska. Whether a collision occurred or not, the United States did admit to having submarines in the area, monitoring the Russian naval exercises. And after the initial incident, Russian dive teams found what they claimed to be a piece of a conning tower from a U.S. or British nuclear submarine. The object couldn't be raised from the seabed, however, and the Russians guarded it with warships so that no other nations could approach the debris. It was around this time that the Russians claimed the remains belonged to the USS Toledo, a different U.S. submarine that actually was docked in Scotland at the time of the accident. Not everyone is on board with the collision theory. Others have suggested that the Kursk was testing experimental torpedoes at the time of the accident. Known as the Squall, these high-speed, supercavitating rocket-propelled torpedoes are designed to travel too fast to be avoidable at close range. They can travel 230 miles per hour, which is roughly three to four times faster than any other torpedo. However, how the experimental torpedoes may have caused the accident remains unclear. Theories range from a malfunction in the Squall torpedo itself to NATO subs firing on the Kursk in order to destroy the Squall. While none of this can be entirely ruled out, the Kursk wasn't known to have had any Squall torpedoes aboard at the time of the accident. While the collision theory and the squall theory are both plausible, the most credible and likely explanation for the accident is that it was caused by a malfunctioning torpedo, which set off a chain reaction that caused the rest of the torpedoes on the Kursk to explode. The first explosion that registered would therefore have been the initial torpedo explosion, and the second explosion would have been when the resulting fire detonated warheads on some of the Kursk's other munitions. Official intelligence reports confirm this theory. According to this explanation, far from an experimental new torpedo, the Kursk was carrying older torpedoes that used hydrogen peroxide liquid as a propellant. The use of high-test peroxide, or HTP, powered torpedoes had been stopped in British submarines after a similar accident in the 1950s. Nonetheless, it was still cleared for use by the Russian Navy in 1997. When the decision was first made to raise the Kursk from the seafloor, plans to bring up the entire submarine were rejected. Instead, the decision was made to cut off the forward torpedo compartment and leave it at the bottom of the sea. This raised some eyebrows, even though it was billed as a safety measure because the front end had an unknown amount of potentially live torpedoes still sitting in it. However, this explanation doesn't really hold up. The sub did indeed carry nuclear warheads that had to be carefully removed. Later, underwater investigations got a chance to examine the torpedo compartment and found a piece of hull debris from the number four torpedo hatch just 50 meters behind where the main explosion occurred. This discovery gave further credibility to the theory that a torpedo malfunctioned in the tube, starting a fire that then spread to the other torpedoes. While all these theories have their merits, there's still one more. In 2005, the French-made documentary Kursk a submarine in troubled waters suggested that the accident was actually caused by a combination of several theories. In this version, not only was the Kursk testing the Squall torpedo, but it was also demonstrating it to the Chinese, whom the Russians intended on selling it to. Obviously, this upset the U.S., which sent its own submarine in the area to observe. The USS Toledo and Memphis submarines were following the Kursk when the Toledo accidentally collided with the Kursk. This collision, according to the theory, did not register on seismographs. The Toledo retreated and then, fearing retaliation from a squall torpedo, the Memphis opened fire on the Kursk. 
The torpedo from the Memphis entered the Kursk's torpedo compartment, marking the first recorded explosion. Then, the resulting fire detonated the explosives in the torpedo compartment, including the highly explosive squalls. This was the second registered explosion, which sank the Kursk. This was followed, theoretically, by an international cover-up. Hmm, pretty elaborate. And there is no evidence to prove this exotic, all-of-the-above version. For now, the truth of what happened to the Kursk remains a mystery. So what do you think? What is your theory on why the Kursk went down? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of